Hello, dear colleagues and everyone who is watching this live stream from YouTube or the recording of this live stream. This is the second episode in a series of training presentations on radio wave propagation and antenna basics. In the previous episode we covered the origins of electromagnetic wave. Uh, we discussed the sources of electromagnetic radiation and looked at some basic parameters of electromagnetic radiation of its propagation properties uh, as well as had a short discourse uh, on the decibel notion. And today we are going to start with the propagation properties of radio signals. But before we begin, I would like to briefly discuss the results of a quiz test that you took last time. So let me show you the results. The results are quite positive. And uh, however, the first question divided the opinions and uh, around one fourth of you uh, answered wrongly. Uh, but actually magnetic uh, dipoles are present in nature only in this form. There are no magnetic monopoles. Uh, that means that each magnet has a north pole and a south pole. And if you divide it, each piece will have its own north pole and south pole. So there are no monopoles, magnetic monopoles. Uh, that is why the first yes answer is correct here. The second question, uh, most of you answered correctly. The Faraday's law of induction is uh, the equation which describes the working principle of generator. Because the induction is what we observe in the generator's working principle. So this is the main feature of generators, uh, the induction of electromagnetic energy of the electromotive force. So this is uh, the correct answer. The third question was a bit, a bit confusing for you, as I can see from uh, the distribution of answers. Uh, but of course, the electrical field is the field which defines the polarization. Uh, this is uh, assumed by convention, by engineers and scientists, uh, that we define the polarization as the orientation of electrical field. Uh, a lot of, uh, quite a big per percentage of you answered that there is a electrical and magnetic fields uh, which define the polarization, uh, which can be partially correct because they affect each other, they define each other, they produce each other, and that could mean that the polarization is actually uh, defined by both electrical and magnetic because they are intertwined, they, they are interconnected. However, uh, it was more specific question and it related to the electrical field only. Uh, then everyone uh, answered correctly to the question about uh, the mode of propagation of electromagnetic wave. This is a TEM or transverse electric and magnetic mode. So there's nothing to discuss. Uh, well, here you had to use a formula which I presented to you to divide 300 by uh, frequency in megahertz to obtain the wavelength in meters. And it was 300 divided by 100, uh, 3 meters. And then you had to convert the decibels to the uh, times how much uh, the stronger the signal, uh, how much stronger the signal becomes if it is amplified by 13 decibels. And uh, the correct answer is 20 because 10 is 10 times and 3 is 2 times. So you multiply 10 by 2 and you get 20 times more stronger. And the last question, almost all of you answered correctly. Uh, this, the radiated power which we observe in the output of the antenna after the transmitter, the transmission line, and after the antenna itself. 
uh, based on these numbers will be 43 dBm. Uh, so one of you forgot to uh, subtract one decibels of TX line loss. Uh, today we are going to have a quiz as well after this episode, but now let us start with this quite a broad subject, namely propagation properties of radio signals. We are going to continue the subjects throughout uh, different episodes, not just this one. Today we are going to start and we are going to start with the different losses which uh, can be experienced by our electromagnetic signal while propagating through so-called free space. And by free space I uh, assume not just merely a vacuum but an atmosphere, an earth atmosphere or a troposphere uh, where most of the radio communications takes place, take place. The troposphere uh, extends to around 13 kilometers on average from the uh, earth surface and most of the radio communications take place there including microwave point-to-point uh, -point radios, uh, uh, microwave communications. All right. In order to understand the free space loss, which will be our first sub subject of our discussion, uh, let us assume a physical obstruction. We'll have to introduce this physical obstruction in order to produce some equations out of it. And the first, uh, first of all, let's imagine an isotropic source of radiation. Uh, this is an imaginary point hanging in the space and emitting uh, electromagnetic energy evenly in all the directions around it so that it produces a kind of a sphere and we can evaluate an energy at every time instance around the sphere and this sphere will be uh, expanding with each time instance and we will see that this radiated power per unit area or power density, which we are going to evaluate, this parameter is going, is going to decrease which, with each time instance. Uh, we can compare this to a balloon. If we inhale the balloon, it becomes bigger, but the material becomes thinner and thinner at each instance. Uh, the same happens with the electromagnetic energy. Uh, the larger is the sphere around this isotropic radiator, the less is uh, radiated power density. Uh, also, I have to mention that the gain of isotropic radiator is equal to zero, zero dBi. Uh, that means that there is no any particular direction in which the signal is stronger than in the other directions, like it is the case with the real-world antenna, which has some degree of directivity. In isotropic radiator, equally emits energy evenly in all the directions, so there is no directivity, the directivity is zero, and the gain of this uh, radiator is zero dBi. Uh, we will have to use, of course, the area of the sphere, which is equal to 4p times d squared. And now let us define this isotropic power density. At any given uh, instance, at any given point around this isotropic radiator. So, uh, the so-called isotropic power density per unit area will be equal to the total power uh, the total power which the isotropic radiator emits uh, divided by the area of the sphere we are looking at. So this will be the isotropic power density, the total power which is radiated divided by the overall area of the sphere. And this is to assume a transmitter. 
separately we'll have to take into account the receiver part. Uh, the complete system consists of transmitter and receiver. And uh, just like the transmitter, we, we, we can uh, characterize the receiver uh, with this energy to be received by the particular surface area. This surface area is called the effective, uh, the effective surface area. And uh, let us define it like this. This is the isotropic effective uh, area of the receiver, or if we are speaking about the actual antenna, this will be a parameter of this antenna. Uh, this, an this parameter is also called an aperture of the antenna. And by definition, it is equal to lambda squared divided by 4p. Uh, okay, so this effective surface area intercepts the, the, the signal which is transmitted by the transmitter. Uh, and now we have to combine both the transmitting signal and the received uh, surface area. So we multiply the transmitted power density by the received antenna effective area. And we obtain the received power, or PRX the received power of the system, uh, which then produces the equation which you see on your screen. And this is the final result. In order to evaluate the loss uh, which the signal experienced while propagating through, through some medium, through the atmosphere, for example, or vacuum even, we'll have to uh, make to, to make up a relation between the transmitted power and received power. And this relation will show us the degree of the loss in this uh, particular situation. So what uh, is interesting to us is the relation between the transmitted power and the received power. But before we proceed further, uh, let us introduce a notion of directivity. Here's an example of two different radiators. The first one is uh, already known to us isotropic radiator with a directivity equal to zero or gain equal to zero. And the second is the real antenna which has a certain degree of directivity and a gain which is not, as, is not zero, it's more than zero. Uh, we can see that it emits energy more in a particular di direction and the rest of the energy is di distributed elsewhere uh, around its vertical axis. So there is a difference between this idealized uh, assumption, physical abstraction and the real antenna, real uh, transmitter. And this difference can be characterized by the directivity or D parameter, denoted as uh, D capital. So this is a parameter of an antenna which measures the degree to which the radiation emitted is concentrated in a single direction. So we are going to use this notion further in, in uh, producing the equation that we need. And actually this relation between the received power and the transmitted power will be equal to lambda divided by 4p d squared as we obtained from the previous slide, from the previous uh, equation. And we're going to also multiply this by the directivity of the transmitter and directivity of the receiver in order to uh, get away from this physical abstraction and uh, take a look at the real world situation where we have two antennas, one transmitting antennas, the other is receiving antennas and how do they combine together? They both are ch characterized by this D, directivity. So we have to multiply these two directivities with this right part of the equation and then we get this relation. The received power divided by transmitted power. So this relation will give us uh, the total loss of the signal in the system. 
uh, just loss uh, because of the propagation itself, the loss, the free space loss, so called. So this expression gives us one of the most fundamental equations for radio communication engineers, which is known as freeze transmission equation. Uh, this is one of the basics for link planners, for microwave link planners, for uh, any uh, radio engineer in this field, because it gives us this relation between the received signal power and transmitted signal power. So this can be applied uh, for any uh, communication system using the radio waves for propagation. And if we convert this equation to the decibels, then we obtain the following. We get the received signal in decibels on the left, and then we have uh, the transmitted signal in decibels. We add the directivity or gain of transmitting antenna, and we add the directivity or gain of the receiving antenna. And also we have some constant, which will always, always be there, and this constant uh, depends on the wavelength or, or on the frequency of the signal and on the distance, of course. This is intuit uh, uh, intuitively we can understand this because the total loss uh, is dependent on both the frequency or wavelength and on the distance which, uh, the, through which the signal propagates, travels. So we will have these uh, different values uh, characterizing the transmitter, the receiver, both antennas, and also there will be some constant added to this uh, equation. And this equation is uh, maybe more familiar to you and to radio engineers, microwave engineers, and link planners, because it doesn't use any directivity notion here and it is uh, converted upside down. So we take a transmitted power and divide it by the received power. So we convert it upside down and we get rid of this directivity notion. By this we assume that our antennas are again physical obstruction without directivity and without any gain at all. So their gain equal to zero in decibels. And we can see that now uh, we don't include this in our equation. In decibels it is equal to zero. If we convert it to times it will be one. So one multiplied by one multiplied by this constant. And this is called the loss factor, which uh, represents only the distance and the wavelength, not any parameters of the antenna itself. The parameters of the antenna can be included later on when we uh, use this equation with different other equations. But for now, let us, uh, let us leave just this one uh, additional parameter, which is the loss factor, and thus we get free space loss equation or free space path loss equation which is more commonly known to link planners, for example, to radio engineers, because it allows us to, to for the time being, get rid of these uh, antenna parameters, right? So it only depends on the distance and on the wavelength. And if we convert this to the decibels, then we obtain the following. We have just a single uh, part in our... Uh, in the right side of our equation. And if we try to convert it to the decibels, we get something like this. Uh, we get divided this into the three parts. The first one dependent on the frequency, 20 logarithm frequency, then 20 logarithm uh, of distance, and 20 logarithm of 4p divided by the speed of light. And the final component is going to give us some constant because the first two components are dependent, they are variables, they are dependent on the signal to be transmitted, on its frequency and on the distance of our communication link. The final uh, component is a constant. 
and it is equal to 145.45. Please note the minus sign. This is interesting. The minus sign will be important for us and it will be it will bring a bit of confusion which we will clear out and uh, I hope that this will make it less confusing for you, this equation. Okay, so what do we have as a result of our um, expressions? We have a freeze transmission equation which in decibels look like this and we have a free space loss equation which in decibels can be expressed like this. And we see the difference. Uh, we can see that in the first equation we obtain the received signal power in decibels and we use uh, the parameters of the antennas, transmitting and receiving antennas. And uh, the result is also dependent on two variables, lambda, which is the wavelength, and d, which is the distance. In the second case, we don't have this received signal level. We just find out the loss factor. We find out how much of our signal is lost while propagating in decibels. So what is the attenuation of the signal? And then later on we can use the transmitter power, uh, the antenna gain, uh, the transmission loss, together with a couple of uh, additional parameters, to produce the received signal level. So this is like an intermediate uh, value, this free space loss, which allows us to, uh, to make further calculations. But it is useful because it gives us an impression of how much signal do we just lose in the free space. And this is, uh, of course, while signal is propagating in a vacuum, it already loses its energy, as I showed you with this balloon example. So free space loss is present is also is, is also present in space, in the outer space, in somewhere where there is no atmosphere, there is no gases. Uh, it present is this present as well in the Earth atmosphere, in the troposphere. So we have to take into, into account both on Earth for the communication on Earth for the communication between the Earth and, let's say, satellite or uh, any other object in space out of the orbit of the Earth and uh, for the communication between the satellites, for example, the free space loss is present all the time. And uh, we will see that there are different other factors which add up uh, to the total losses well, when we are talking about the Earth communications, uh, about the communications in the atmosphere. But for now, uh, let us convert this equation to include some measurement units. And this form reflects actually uh, frequency taken in hertz and distance taken in meters. And you can see this uh, constant, which is minus 145, right? Uh, this is not very convenient for the microwave industry especially, because we'll have to, to, to include too many zeros in this hertz notion and in this meters uh, parameter. That is why we can convert this to gigahertz into kilometers. And it will be more practical for us, because mostly our propagation frequencies are, are given in the gigahertz and our link distances are given in the kilometers. And then magically this constant becomes positive, as you can see. Uh, there is a little magic because this is just a characteristic of logarithm, but uh, the fact is the following, that we have different uh, constants and in the first case this constant is negative. So the next question uh, is very intriguing uh, and this question I'm going to ask you maybe about your opinion. The question uh, is the following. What do you think? Can the free space loss can be negative? because we have this constant, negative constant, and we have some other components in our creation. Can it be that this negative component is larger than the both 
first and the second components, and thus we obtain negative free space loss. So I'm waiting for your suggestions in the comment section. Uh, it's interesting to know your opinion about it, because it, this is the question that uh, was very interesting for me as well. And now we're going to find an answer together to this question. Uh, because if it would be negative, then it would make no sense. We cannot have a negative loss. Then it would be amplification, right? So, but how the signal could amplify while propagating somewhere? Uh, we just find, found out that it only attenuates, it only loses its power, its energy. Uh, Massimiliano wrote us his uh, answer and he says that D much lar larger than lambda. And by D uh, he means the distance of the link and lambda is a uh, wavelength, right? Yes, uh, could you please elaborate on this more? What did you mean by this? This is some kind of um, rule or assumption, but how do this relate to this equation? Still, the question is, can we obtain the negative free space loss based on this expression which uh, Massimiliano wrote us? What do you think? You just can guess and write yes or no without any explanation to make it faster, maybe. Is there somebody watching us? <laughs> I hope so. So what do you think, yes or no? And uh, based on the assumption that we can have the negative free space loss, I'm going to show you an example. And uh, we will see that no, okay. Yeah, that's one opinion from Edgar's. Waiting for more opinions, no, again, no. No, okay. Now we have three no's. I think that's more than enough to prove that this is so, that this is correct answer. But could you bring formulas back to screen? Okay, please, <laughs> here are the formulas. And we use this uh, equation with minus 145, this, uh, the second form of the free space loss equation. The question is, can, can the first two components be less totally than 145? Okay, so let me show you how can we obtain the negative value and then let me explain because uh, uh, why it is not legitimate, why we can uh, disprove this uh, negative value. So, I just invented an example of how can we obtain the negative value. And to obtain negative value, we have to take specific uh, parameters of our radio link. So let us, let's us assume that we have a frequency of 10 kilohertz. This will be our... Uh, input frequency, right? Our signal. And then we'll take a distance of D which is one kilometer. And of course we will now uh, use our second equation which is free space loss equals 20 logarithm from frequency, adding 20 logarithm of distance and minus 100.5. Let's write it like this to, to, be simp to, to make it simpler. Okay, so this frequency is in uh, hertz. 
and this d is in uh, meters. It's very important. Then we can continue. So the free space loss here, we take the 10,000 hertz here, we obtain a logarithm of 10,000, it will be 4, 4 multiplied by 20, it's 80. Here the distance is in the meters, so it's 1,000 meters. Logarithm of 1,000 is 3, and 3 multiplied by 20 is 60. Minus 145. And that's it. So we get 140 minus 145. We got minus 5. How can it be? Is it possible now that we obtained, given this frequency and this distance, we obtained uh, this value, this negative value? And now we'll have to in take into account what Massimiliano said us. He wrote his uh, command, the d much larger than lambda. What does it mean? d is a distance and lambda is a wavelength. What is the wavelength of this signal of 10,000 uh, hertz, of 10 kilohertz? It turns out that the wavelength of this signal is going to be 30 kilometers. Wow. That's quite, quite impressive signal, right? 30 kilometers. So this is our wavelength. And our distance is just one kilometer. So we violate this rule. The distance is not much larger than the wavelength. That is why we cannot use this free space loss formula. It's not, it's not legitimate for us to use it because this rule is violated. And let me also show you that this whole situation looks unrealistic. This uh, frequency belongs to the VLF frequency range, which is very low frequency range. And these frequencies, of course, they are used for communications, but they are used seldom. They are used for radio navigation services, for gover government time radio, and for some military services, military communications. And uh, this is very specific range. And by trans uh, in order to uh, transmit this range, we'll need very large wire antennas. These wire antennas uh, looks like a snake with many bands. And uh, these antennas can extend to several kilometers long. So this will be uh, the physical dimensions of these antennas. These are large antennas which propagate to uh, up to 20,000 kilometers long uh, distances, right? So in order to uh, transmit such a, a low frequency signal, we need very large dimensions of our antennas. We need to use these long wire antennas which are several kilometers long. And if we calculate the so-called far field for this type of antennas, far field distance. Far field distance, this is a distance where the free space loss uh, kicks in. The free space loss uh, equation starts working there, right? So uh, there is a near field where there is a different laws of how the signal power uh, is propagating. And then when we reach the so-called far field, then the free space loss uh, equation becomes legitimate for us, right? And we can use it for estimating uh, the signal power at each uh, distance away from the antenna. We will return to this notion later when we'll discuss the antenna's parameters, right? But for now, uh, we'll have to know that for this signal, which has, uh, sorry, for this antenna, uh, which is used for, for transmitting VLF signals, the, the dimensions of this antenna is few kilometers, right? And the far field can reach up to, well, few kilometers. So it can be five kilometers, 
or even 10 kilometers, right? So, well, it can be, uh, it, it depends, it depends uh, actually on these uh, dimensions of these antennas. But, uh, for the, it can be also around one kilometer. Oh, sorry, uh, five kilometers, it's way too much, no. I think that uh, there is a special formula for calculating the far field. And it is rather up to one kilometer than five kilometers. Sorry, I just remembered, yes, because I prepared for this uh, in advance. Uh, and using this formula, I found out that it could be up to one kilometer. It could be less, but it could be up to one kilometer. And that would mean that our far field starts at one kilometer, right? And here we calculate this free space loss at a distance of one kilometer. That means that our distance is not even in the Fresnel zone uh, region. In, it's not in the far field. It's on the edge between the far field and the uh, near field, right? Or it can still be in the near field. And in the near field, the other rules applies. So we cannot actually say uh, that this free space loss equation works in this near field. That is why we cannot use this uh, free space loss formula. And that is why this uh, assumption is important for us. This rule which we use for using this formula. So the distance is much larger than, than the wavelength. That will make sure that we are in a far field, right? In most of the cases. Also, such a long uh, wave signals usually propagate up to 20,000 kilometers long distances. So, these are an enormously uh, long links, right? And uh, finding some loss at the one kilometer distance is not practical after all. So that is why uh, we can say definitely now that the free space loss cannot be negative. Of course, it can be uh, as a mathematical expression, but if we're talking about the practical application in the real radio communication engineering, that it, this is not possible. And that is why we have some uh, rules which we have to um, obey. Far field should be, should be 10 times lambda, no? Uh, Massimiliano asks. Uh, I'm not sure how much, um, but I guess at least five, uh, 10 times more. Of course, this, as I mentioned, is dependent on the dimensions of the antenna itself. So, uh, first of all, we find out this far field, where it starts for the particular frequency and particular antenna dimensions. We can find out this far field distance and starting from this far field distance, we can uh, apply our free space loss equation. So this rule of thumb that it should be uh, much longer, the distance should be much longer than the wavelength is uh, kind of a safe assumption that we are calculating free space loss in the far field, not in the near field. But I will explain these fields later and then uh, we will get back to this and it will be clearer, of course. All right, so this is what concerned uh, signal propagation and signal attenuation in so-called free space. So this is in force even in vacuum in outer space. What if we return on Earth and talk about the uh, radio communications here on Earth in the troposphere? And uh, in this case, we have to take into account also the atmosphere itself, right? Uh, because uh, electromagnetic wave, while propagating through some medium, let's say it would be at our atmosphere, the mixture of gases, it loses power. And it loses power because it scatters 
it uh, or reflects from the atoms and molecules and absorbs uh, get gets absorbed by these atoms and molecules of the gases present in the atmosphere so this scattering and absorption uh, are the next factors which uh, attenuate our signal, our, our electromagnetic wave propagate, propagating through the atmosphere. So let us take a look at the so-called atmospheric absorption loss. Uh, this this uh, type of loss, is this name is self-explaining because this is a loss caused by the absorption in the atmosphere, by the absorption of the atmospheric gases. And this is quite an interesting uh, graph. So let's take a look at it and explain it a little bit. Uh, so on the x axis we have the wavelength, right? Uh, from the shortest wavelength and higher frequency on the left to the longest wavelength and lower frequency on the right. And we'll start with this ionizing uh, radiation, which, uh, which, which consists of gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet light. And we can see that the atmospheric so-called opacity for this type of radiation is 100%. What, what does it mean? It means that uh, the atmosphere, the upper atmospheric layers block this type of radiation from the outer space. So our atmosphere is not transparent. And if this opacity is equal to zero, it means that our atmosphere would be totally transparent for, for, for certain uh, frequencies, certain uh, radiation. But for this ionizing and harmful uh, radiation, our atmosphere, luckily for us, is not transparent and it's fully blocked in the upper atmospheric layers because it gives an energy in the form of photons to these atoms uh, of, of the gases which are present in atmosphere and it get, the, the whole energy gets absorbed by our atmosphere. And uh, par uh, par uh, particularly the ultraviolet part of the spectrum is absorbed by our ozone layer because it gets into the reaction with the molecules of oxygen. Uh, okay, then what we see is the window of the visible light. There is a visible light uh, which gets through our atmosphere and uh, <clears throat> it's uh, the, our atmosphere is trans transparent for this. Uh, then we have some uh, radiation, some frequencies which are more or less attenuated, so that, that there is a series of peaks and valleys and, and, and notches uh, because it gets involved into different reactions with the molecules uh, depending on the frequency. Then we get again some part of the spectrum which is uh, this, this was the infrared spectrum and then we get some part of the spectrum which is fully blocked as well and then we start uh, getting closer to our uh, radio frequencies and microwave frequencies and we can see that there luckily for us this part of the spectrum is fully transparent the opacity is zero and this concerns this uh, centimetric and uh, mostly centimetric or super high frequency. These are centimetric waves, right? Which are mostly used in the microwave industry. Also, uh, there is some part of the spectrum belongs to the millimetric uh, wavelengths, which are EHF, extra high frequency. And this part of the spectrum is not so lucky because it gets attenuated uh, at some extent. We can see these two uh, notches. Let me show you with the laser pointer. Here we have two, this, uh, these two peaks and this corresponds to some higher microwave uh, frequency ranges like 60, 80 gigahertz. We'll see why uh, the atmosphere is not transparent for, this, uh, for these particular frequencies. And then we get to 23 gigahertz and then uh, 
uh, lower and lower and somewhere below let's say 10 gigahertz uh, there is uh, no attenuation because the atmosphere at all because it is fully transparent <coughs> and uh, <coughs> another interesting observation that we can draw from this graph is that if we go further on the right to the right where the wavelength is even larger we again have 100 percent of opacity why is it so it's interesting because at this wavelength our atmosphere starts deflecting the radio or the radiation uh, well it doesn't matter really much if we're t talking about the earth communications between two radio stations in for example vhf range but if we're talking about uh, communication between the space and earth or some uh, portion of radiation coming from earth, from from space then uh, it starts it starts getting bounced back from our atmosphere and also it is refle refracted very much so uh, this is another factor why it can be like deflected, why right? it can turn away from its initial course. All right. And now let's explore our atmosphere in a greater detail. And again, the question to you, what are the main compounds of Earth atmosphere? Let's start with the with, with, with the component which prevails in the atmosphere. So please write your suggestions which component uh, is present in the atmosphere more than others. And uh, of course we will take into account different compounds and we will check if these compounds matter to us, if they matter in terms of the absorption of radiomagnetic uh, radiation so, and particularly in our radio frequency spectrum and microwave spectrum. Yes, two right answers straight away. This is nitrogen, that's correct. And nitrogen of the dry air, well, let us uh, assume that we're talking about the dry air initially. And 78% of the dry air of the atmosphere consists of nitrogen. And the second one, I guess Massimiliano meant the second compound, which is uh, ex oxygen, which consists, which, uh, which has 21% of the total atmospheric compounds. So, uh, and oxygen is going to matter to us. I will explain later on why is it so. So, nitrogen, oxygen, what is the third one? What do you think? What is the third uh, prevailing component in the atmosphere of the Earth? Uh, H2O. No, we, we, we are not talking about uh, some water gases, water uh, Vapors, we're talking about the dry atmosphere, so without any humidity at all. So, uh, this, yeah, and Edgar's is correct. This is argon, inert gas. And this, <coughs> the, the concentration of argon is about 1% of the total in the atmosphere. Yes, noble gas. This is a noble gas, right. And... Other than that, the fourth component is a carbon dioxide. Yes, correct. Uh, Massimiliano was faster than me, so let's assume that he was the first. The carbon dioxide uh, is uh, around four hundredths of a percent. And the other small fraction are a mixture of different other gases. Okay, and then on top of this, we will have a uh, a variable amount of water vapor and on average it's uh, one percent at sea level so this is the water vapor this is a water uh, which is uh, distributed in the atmosphere as a gas and of course it is going to matter to us as well because of the molecular dimensions 
let us take a look at these two molecules. Uh, the first one is an oxygen molecule and the second is water vapor molecule. And the dimensions of these molecules are, uh, are uh, very much similar to the dimensions of the wavelength of some particular radiation. That is why they resonate with these frequencies and that is why they absorb these frequencies more than any other frequencies. We will take a look at this graph and we will understand how does it relate to the previously stated compounds of the atmosphere. Uh, and this graph consists of two parts. The first, the first graph is representing attenuation depending on frequency for the dry air. It is marked in blue and in red there is another graph representing attenuation of the uh, standard atmosphere. What does it mean? The standard atmosphere contains a certain amount of water vapor in it. And namely it is 7.5 grams to a cubic meter in the standard atmosphere, right? So we have this dry air when uh, there is <coughs> some degree of attenuation already and on top of that we have the standard atmosphere when there is also a water vapors which are present and which attenuate signal even more. So uh, by the red graph we represent the superimposition of the dry air attenuation and the water vapor attenuation. So this red graph is actually a, a sum or a, a superimposition of both. And this is the final attenuation value for us. So this includes both uh, attenuation from atmospheric gases and attenuation from the water vapor. <clears throat> Let us zoom in a little bit to represent frequencies which are typical for microwave communications. And you can see that uh, actually what matters to us is up to 100 gigahertz. Uh, this is here on the graphs, mid in the middle of the graph, right? So we have two main components here. The oxygen itself, which is a dry atmosphere case. Here we have two peaks of this oxygen attenuation. Uh, and the water vapor induced attenuation, which is uh, shown here. And if we superimpose one graph over the other, then we get the total attenuation for the standard atmosphere. Now let us take a look. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to mention that on the left we have the attenuation in dB per kilometer. So, once again, the components. And it turns out that the oxygen molecules resonate with a wavelength of half a centimeter, which corresponds roughly to 60 gigahertz. And that is why we have such a peak here of attenuation. Because this frequency, this particular frequency resonates at a wavelength of half a centimeter. And half a centimeter is a wavelength of 60 gigahertz, right? And uh, that is why the oxygen molecules absorb this particular frequency more than any other surrounding frequencies. And further we have a water vapor which resonates at a wavelength of 1.3 centimeters which corresponds to 23 gigahertz. So that is why there is another peak over there 20, at 23 gigahertz. And this is the case of water, right? So this is a standard atmosphere uh, and we can see that these two frequencies are attenuated the most in this uh, up to this 100 gigahertz range, frequency range, which is interested, uh, interesting for us. Uh, all right, so uh, an interesting note uh, regarding this observation. Uh, actually, choosing 24 gigahertz as a microwave license free band can be explained largely by this fact that it gets attenuated more than any surrounding frequency bands and thus uh, we have more isolation between the links in a lightly controlled environment. That is why 
uh, this band was selected as a license-free band, right? So we have a lightly controlled environment. We don't issue the license for particular links. We just uh, limit the output power uh, of the signal per, per each link. But this natural uh, characteristic of the air allows us to isolate one link from another uh, more, more efficiently. This is one of the interesting facts. And another interesting fact is that 80 gigahertz signal, which is somewhere in here, we can see that it gets attenuated, uh, attenuated less than 60 gigahertz signal at the same distance. So that's quite interesting and counterintuitive, right? Uh, we, we have larger frequency, which gets attenuated less than lower frequency of 60 gigahertz. That is why we're using E-band links for longer distances than the 60 gigahertz links. Yes, and as Massimiliano writes, uh, that it well ex explains the big difference between 60 and 80 gigahertz. 80 gig yeah, 60 gigahertz just can be used for few few kilometers maybe, and uh, but these uh, 80 gigahertz links can be used up to 10 kilometers and even more if the rain rate is not so intensive. Speaking about the rain rate, this will be our final contributor to signal attenuation while propagating in the atmosphere. So let's take a look at this graph here. This graph represents how uh, rain, fog, hail and snow, all these uh, events can be summarized under general umbrella term hydrometeors of how they affect signal propagation. Of course, this factor is, uh, has a sporadic nature. It's not always present. Uh, the rain uh, can start in a second and result in attenuation of tens of decibels for a particular distance and particular frequency. And we can only statistically forecast this uh, rain intensity, right? Based on so-called rain zones, which are defined by the ITU and by um, introducing a notion of the rain intensity expressed in millimeters per hour. So we always have to take care of uh, the rain zone, which are discussed in each particular case, and on the link distance, because these factors are going to affect our forecast for the link attenuation. And this, this is just uh, a forecast, right? Uh, unlike the atmosphere, which is present all the time, the atmosphere is always there, the free space is always there, and we always get this attenuation. Uh, however, in case of hydrometeors, we have it as a sporadic uh, series of events throughout the year, so we can only uh, theoretically and statistically predict them, and we can only statistically evaluate uh, the availability of our link uh, in case there will be some precipitation going on throughout the year. We don't know when it happens, how intense will be the year. We just have some statistical average values. And this is what we have to deal with in this case. And in this case, there are two lar large effects, which are absorption and scattering. As I told you, absorption is at the uh, energy of electromagnetic wave gets absorbed and the scattering that it gets uh, reflected, defle deflected and uh, that it changes the direction of its original mo motion. And among the hydrometeors so-called we can uh, name rain, snow, hail and fog and from all of this rain is the predominant. It has uh, tremendous effect on the microwave frequencies, especially in the upper uh, range for millimetric waves, for example, for extra high frequency range and for upper super high frequency range. Uh, if we're talking about snow, that it 
doesn't affect the microwaves unless this is a wet snow and contains some amount of water. A hail or has almost no effect and fog attenuates also microwaves to a certain extent and this effect is uh, more pronounced for higher frequencies. Uh, we consider the attenuation from precipitation to be negligible below 5 gigahertz. So we can just neglect it, disregard it. And the higher we, we get in the frequency, the higher gets the, the attenuation. And also for higher precipitation intensity, for example, in a tropical region, we will have higher attenuation. Because what matters is the intensity of the rainfall. We can have like very uh, light drizzle 60% uh, of the year, like in uh, England, for example, or we can have very heavy downpours throughout a month, like in a tropical region. And this is going to affect the link uh, significantly. Of course, taking into account the distance and the frequency. Uh, we can uh, disregard some small intensity drizzle, but if we're talking about downpours of precipitation, then it can block uh, our signal completely. Another uh, significant note is that horizontal polarization is affected more than vertical. That is why uh, link planners, micro link planners prefer using vertical polarization by default because it doesn't suffer as much as the horizontal from precipitation. And this can be explained by the fact that the falling raindrop uh, has an oblong form and it resembles the horizontally polarized wave and thus it absorbs the energy of horizontally polarized wave more than the vertical one. Uh, also seems for me a bit confusing because uh, uh, we can all imagine uh, the drops of rain being more vertical but actually this oblong form of falling raindrop uh, resembles horizontally polarization more and thus is affects this polarization more than the vertical one. And the ITU uses the following uh, uh, equation uh, which is called the specific attenuation. Uh, sorry, the total attenuation denoted by A and it is expressed in decibels and it depends of course on the link distance and on two coefficients. These coefficients are called the specific attenuation and expressed in decibels per kilometer. And the first one gives us attenuation due to absorption by oxygen and water vapor and the second one, gamma R, gives us the attenuation due to absorption and scattering by hydrometeors or precipitation. So we include uh, here two factors, the atmosphere itself with its gases compounds and its water vapor and uh, the precipitation on the other side. So these two larger components present in our Earth atmosphere, in the troposphere where the radio communication takes place. Of course, we, we shouldn't forget about the free space loss, which is present even in space and also it is actual on Earth. So the total loss will consist of free space loss and atmospheric absorption loss and attenuation due to precipitation. So three main components of attenuation of the signal. And now uh, please ask any questions you wish and I'll try to uh, answer them. I'll wait a little bit for, 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 for some amount of time for your questions because that's it all from my side and if you have something to say, to add, or to comment, or to, to question then please go on.
If no, then I'm going to suggest you take a quiz, which will be in the description of this video. And uh, let me remind you that uh, for those of you who will answer all the quizzes after all episodes, uh, there is a special price guaranteed. So this is will be your interest. And Kristaps uh, is asking why solid water like ice and snow does not affect radio propagation as much as liquid water. It is a water molecule after all. Yes, that's true. Uh, that's true. That's the same molecule. Uh, of course, I'm sharing now the experience from the practical point of view because we observed a lot of situations uh, even with the higher frequency bands like E band 80 gigahertz. Uh, we experienced that uh, the link doesn't get attenuated at all if it snows heavily, right? And if it starts raining, then we see the significant signal loss. So uh, this was, uh, of course, uh, this is explained by the theory, but I can share my own experience as a radio engineer that this is actually happening uh, in the real world. And I can only assume that uh, this is related to not a mole molecule, because uh, on the molecule level uh, we are speaking about atmospheric absorption. So there will be an oxygen molecule and there will be water vapor molecule. And uh, this is uh, like a gas uh, aggregated aggregation uh, of, of, this, of the water molecules, right? But if we're talking about the solid water, then uh, it differs between the solid water and the ice or snow because of different uh, composition of molecules, I would say. So uh, it doesn't, it's not only a matter of molecules because on the molecular level we have this water vapor attenuation, right? <clears throat> because we know that it is resonating at this particular frequency. But if we are <coughs> speaking about <coughs> larger dimensions, like uh, the mo molecular uh, constructions, right? Uh, with different uh, parameters, with different uh, properties, then uh, we're not uh, speaking merely about the molecule itself, but about some larger constructions of the molecules and how they are composed between each other and they are composed differently between the uh, if we're comparing uh, solid state and uh, liquid state right uh, there's a density uh, there's the relation between the molecules viscosity and 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 uh, different uh, parameters like this but of course this is a good theoretical questions to the molecular physics and this is something to research on and to explore further on. Maybe I'll try to search some information and next time I can be more competent in this question because this is interesting question for myself as well. So I'll try to answer it next time. And for now I'm assuming that this is related to the larger construction of the molecules between each other and, uh, and uh, uh, the compounds consisting uh, of which they are consisting yeah uh, this these compounds are different in case of liquid state and the solid state another question is there a real life limit in gigahertz until which it is reasonable to develop radio solutions for communication and when rain atmospheric absorption makes communication not trustworthy so as we learned, uh, we can go, go as high as 100 uh, gigahertz in radio communications. Uh, it's all matter of the distance and it's matter of the rain intensity in the particular rain region. So it's difficult to make uh, a universal rule, let's say, or universal uh, yeah, let's say a universal rule for all, all over the world, all the rain zones and all the distances. We have to take into account different factors. And uh, 
for some regions we can extend our E band to 80 gigahertz, right? To 10 kilometers and some other regions with a higher precipitation intensity, it can reach up to one, two kilometers. And it would be not practical to uh, use larger distances because of rain uh, intensity uh, per kilometer. So it is going to be specific attenuation per kilometer. And larger the distance, the larger is the over total loss. So I'll, I'll say, I would say that uh, the real, there is no such thing as a real life limit, right? Uh, because we see that this graph of attenuation, it is, uh, it is going uh, to these enormous uh, frequencies up to hundreds of gigahertz. And uh, there is no sharp increase like logarithmic increase in this uh, specific attenuation due to uh, gases and due to water vapors. Yes, it is increasing steadily. Uh, so as it increases with the frequencies 100, 200, 300 gigahertz, our specific attenuation increases as well and our distance decreases. So it's more a question of how practical would be for you uh, the radio link less than one kilometer, let's say a few hundred kilo meters between the buildings in the city, for example. If it is still practical for you, I think you can go to 100 gigahertz and higher. If it's not practical, then you have to stay in a lower frequency range. This is the first. And the second is the rain intensity of the region of interest. If it is a desert, for example, with no precipitation at all, then you have no risk of losing your link. Uh, even its uh, frequency is very high. And we also saw that uh, the specific attenuation due to precipitation uh, is going sharply on the in initial part and then it's going to be, uh, uh, it's, it's getting steady and uh, it's even uh, uh, maybe getting constant at some point and not changing that much. So that's also, so there is no actual limit in this, right? You just have to take into account that in the upper range of around 100 gigahertz, your specific attenuation due to precipitation is going to be very large and you have to take this into account and you have to uh, calculate your availability correspondingly. So. This could be some communications with just low, very low availability. So there are different factors and different requirements which you may apply to your link. And the notion of trustworthiness is not so obvious, right? And it depends. I hope this answers your question. Right. Uh, looks like now it's time for uh, examining you. Uh, so please take a quiz and uh, we're going to meet again uh, in a week, next Wednesday, discuss your answers and some additional comments about this lecture. And we're going to continue with the propagation properties of radio signal. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>